Hi everyone, welcome back to our devotion time. Today is November 17th, and our devotion is titled, Because of the Poor, out of Psalm 12, verse 5. The Lord says, I will now rise up, because the poor are being hurt. Because of the moans of the helpless, I will give them the help they want. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father God. Every single day, we are given opportunities to help others that are less fortunate than us. And I pray, Father, for myself and my sisters and brothers that we would reach out to all those that you bring into our path, to all those that you spark that fire in our hearts, Father God, that we would not say no, but that we would have a heart of compassion like you. We praise you and thank you today for your word. And I ask for your anointing to teach that word in Jesus' name. Amen. God's economy is completely opposite from our own. Our currency is money and power, while his are mercy and grace. Our society elevates the rich and prominent. God lifts up the needy and nameless. His main objective isn't getting something from people. It's lavishing himself on them. His heart lies with the poor. He is a defender of the helpless and a protector of the weak. If we desire to please the heart of the Father, then we too will take up the cause of the poor. We will defend them, rescue them, and help them. We will speak for them, honor them, and lavish love on them. Mm. We have talked about this subject before, amen? And you all that have been with me a while, you know my heart toward the homeless and the helpless, <laughs> you know, towards people who are incarcerated, towards anyone who's less fortunate, Lord. You know that the Lord has blessed me and I, and I see somebody less fortunate than myself. I just am so blessed to know that God gave me a heart to serve others like that. I didn't always feel that way. And I'm very grateful that the Lord has given me that and that I am I'm able to act upon it. It blesses God when his children reach out to help the less fortunate. When we see the poor and the needy of our world, or even in our own church, or sometimes our own family, how do we respond? I mean, inwardly, you know, where only you and God can, can know, right? Let's look at how God feels about those less fortunate. We're going to open the word today. And we have quite a bit to talk about. If you want to take notes on the scriptures and then also on the things we're talking about, I'm going to be going over five different areas today and taking us into the word to confirm what we're talking about. So the first area that we're going to discuss is caring for the weak. Okay, and we're going to go over to Leviticus. In chapter 25 and chapter 25 verse 35 and this particular pericope is talking about lending to the poor it says if one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you then you shall help him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God, that your brother may, li may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at a profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. So in other words, the Lord is saying, be like me. I didn't just lend you the land, I gave it to you. I didn't just save you. I literally destroyed your enemies for you. And he says, if one among you, and this is where I thought about family. You know, sometimes we have family that are less fortunate. And because we're, you know, um, what's that old saying? Um, close, no, what is it? Familiarity, familiarity breeds contempt is the saying. 
And, you know, sometimes when we're familiar with someone and we know their story and we know their life and we know their choices, we have a tendency to judge. Right? It's kind of natural. We either have a tendency to judge, but at the same time, um, or, or sometimes make excuses for that person it just depends on the situation but seriously we have people within our own family within our own church body and the Lord is speaking here that we should reach out to the brethren even down to bringing them into our homes like we would for a stranger that we don't know you know sometimes it's easier to help a stranger than it is to help someone that we're close to because we know their story so let's let's contemplate that today Let's go over to Deuteronomy chapter 15. And we're going to hit quite a few scriptures today, so be ready to do some traveling through the Bible, okay? Let's go over to 15 verse 11. For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. Wow! And this whole, this whole passage here, the pericope here, is talking about generosity to the poor. It says, if there is, let's go up to chapter, or verse 7. If there is among you a poor man of your brethren, within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother. But you shall open your hand wide to him, and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. Beware. Lest there be a wicked thought in your heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of the release, is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cry out to the Lord against you, and it becomes sin among you. You shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. Because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works, and in all to which you put your hand. Here is our verse. For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. Wow. That really, if, you, if we sat, we could unpack this for, you know, a whole, we could do a whole sermon on this. Because this is really telling us a lot about God's heart toward the poor and toward those that are less, in, you know, that have a need. And I think, I think the Lord, you know, he warned us here that the, the poor will always be with us. They'll never cease to be. And he tells us in, you know, Jesus tells us as well in the New Testament, the poor will always be among you. Okay. So that is something that we're always going to be given opportunity to minister to is somebody who's less fortunate than we are. And maybe you're like, well, I don't have a lot, but you know what? As we read through here, we're going to find out that God says, if you give, you can't outgive me. I'm going to give it back to you. I'm going to give it back to you. Because when you're lending to the poor, you're not lending to them. You're not giving to them. You're lending to me. And we're going to look at a scripture that tells us that. So when you see the poor, when you see someone in need, don't allow yourself to have wicked thoughts in your heart. Now this here is talking about the seventh year. The seventh year was a year of jubilee and that was when there would be um, free, there would, there would be like a redeeming of the poor and they would be able to be reestablished, that kind of thing. So in other words, this person saying, oh, well, they can wait until the year of jubilee. You know, it's almost the seventh year. They'll be okay until we get there. You know, I'm not going to give to them today just because they have the need. I'm, I'm going to wait until we, we give back to them everything they need, you know, and that's wicked. Father says that's not good. And you know what? I think it's all, there's a lot to unpack about what I think in this aspect, but part of what I believe and one, one aspect of it is that God, the poor will always be among us because God knew that man would fail man would fall man would stumble and end up with nothing he would make wrong choices spend money wrong um you know go bankrupt have situations where he loses what he has and he would have a need and that in that is god giving us in turn those who are in a good place in life because you know life goes up life goes down i mean we all have times where we have a need in our lives right Everybody goes through it eventually. And when we do, if we have given, God is generous without fault. I'm promising you that. I've experienced it. 
where I've had a season in my life where for years and years and years, God gave me the opportunity to sow. And I sowed into the kingdom of God and I gave to the poor and I gave to the church and I gave to people around me. And I was generous with my money and with my time and with food and clothing and whatever else I had, you know, that I could give. And then I went through a season even, and it was by, you know, it was things that happened to me after my first husband died. And I went through a season where I felt flat on my face and I've told you about it, but the Lord was there. And do you know, he brought so many people into my life who were generous and helped me during that time. And I would tell Courtney, you know, I believe I am picking the fruit from the seeds that I have sown in my past because I had never had a deep need like that, not to that extent. And I suddenly was in need, deep need homeless need and the Lord sent food every single day through people he sent funds for gasoline to keep me working the little bit I could work during the time I was so sick during that season I had bronchitis and I was out and living in a car and I I couldn't get well I didn't have insurance and I couldn't work because I couldn't even talk and uh, it was amazing and so to me, every time I give to someone else, I'm, I'm sowing a seed to God. I'm, I'm lending to the Lord. And if I go through a season again in my life, I know he'll be there. And it also to me means that he's going to ab- continue to abundantly bless you so that you have more to give. You know, we're blessed to give. We're blessed to be a blessing. We're not blessed to bless ourselves. Yes. It's okay to give to yourself. However, first of all, make sure you're giving back into the kingdom of God. That's the most important. That is the most important thing. Let's go over to Proverbs 29. I'm looking at our, our list here. I'm like, ooh, I'm, this is going to be a longer video, you guys. <laughs> Proverbs 29. And we're not going to, we're going to be going back and forth because every point has different scriptures from all over the word. So going to kind of be everywhere. Let's go to chapter 29, verse 7. It says, The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. So there were times when I was in that, in that season of my life. And I think I've told you the story. I asked a woman one day, I walked up to her, and all I said to her was, Ma'am, And she would not acknowledge that I was standing there. She looked straight ahead. I was standing right next to her. There was no loud noises. She heard every word I said. And and when I saw that she was not even going to glance at me or acknowledge that I was there as another human being. Very hard-hearted woman. Beautiful woman, though. And wealthy from the looks of it. But she stood there and stared straight ahead and never acknowledged me. And I said, I apologize for bothering you, ma'am. And I walked away. And, you know, I was so sad. I got back in the car and I I told Courtney about it. And it, it almost made me cry, not because, you know, I mean, it was humiliating for me. But I thought about how hard hearted a person has to be, you know, to respond that way. And so we drove across the street to the gas station on the other corner and I got out and I don't even think I got out that time. I think Courtney did because I was, you know, still kind of shell shocked from being treated like that. And he asked this man and the man looked over and smiled and he said, give me one second. And he finished doing his gas and he turned around, he came over and he told me, fill it up. And he filled my entire tank. And that was the kind of people that, you know, um, when you're out there and you're in a situation that you, you're you not trying to avoid work. Because I wasn't trying to avoid work. Um, I just couldn't work right then. I had about a month, a month and a half there where I could barely work a few days a week just enough to keep the car because I was paying a weekly um, 
like it was a loaner car from Lyft. And I was just barely making enough to pay for the car. And everything I was making was going into that. And that was the only roof we had over our head at the time. And so being as sick as I was, and you know, when you get bronchitis, you, you just can't get well if you're sleeping out and it's cold and raining. We had a very rainy winter that year. It was 2018 and 19 when we had so much rain. And um, anyway, but God, he, he just blessed us like that in those kind, kind of situations. So don't ever let your heart be hardened because God says that's wickedness. Our Father says when we're like that with people who are less, you know, who are less fortunate than us, that we're being wicked. We've got other scriptures we're going to go over that talk about that. Because I really want to encourage you to find joy in giving if you have a difficult time. And I understand it because, I mean, everybody, we all look at someone and kind of judge by the cover, you know, the book by the cover. And God doesn't judge our book by the cover, does he? He sees our heart and he says that we can't see the man, heart of man. And he doesn't, anywhere in the word when he tells us to give, he, he never tells us to judge their situation before we give. I want you to take note of that. Um, there's only a couple of verses that talk about not eating if you won't work. And we're going to discuss those two. Um, it says here, Isaiah 25, verse 4. For you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. For the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. So God, Isaiah is speaking to God and he's telling God, you've been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from storms, a shade from heat. For the blast of the things in this world, it says the blast of the terrible ones is as, as, is as, as a storm against the wall. So in other words, it's just like beating you down and beating you down. Have you ever been in a situation, a place in your life where everything goes wrong and it's like everything in the world is beating at you and beating at you and beating at you? Have you ever been there? I have. I've been there more than once in my life. And to have God always be on your side in the midst of all that is amazing. And he says for us to be his hands, for us to be his heart, his compassion, for us to show him to people and not to ask questions, not to worry about where they're going with the money or what they're going to do with the food or, you know, it, it, that's not what God told us. And there is scripture upon scripture. I didn't even pick up all the scriptures there were. There were so many that talk about giving and helping others. Let's go to Isaiah 58 verse 10. It says, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. Woo, that's a promise, you guys. Right there, get excited about that. Seriously, because the Lord says, if you'll extend your soul, if you'll give your heart, if you'll give of yourself to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted person, that soul that's afflicted, and then the light's going to shine on your darkness. This, for me, makes me want to go out and find people to give to and be like, because I've got things in my life that are dark. Don't you? You have areas of your life that feel helpless or hopeless. And, and the Lord says, when you give to others, when you reach out to their need, this makes me cry. Because he says, when you do that, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to make the darkness be like noonday for you child all the clouds will be lifted off of you as you give to others what a beautiful word what a beautiful word let's go to number two this is our second point write this down if you're taking notes the blessing of giving we're going to go through and look at some scriptures on the blessing of giving let's jump back over here to proverbs Sorry, I, I get to I get so excited about some things I start crying and it just blesses my heart because I've lived it 
and I've seen God I've seen him do so much so much we're gonna go to um, let's see here Proverbs 11 okay Proverbs 11 Oops. paper stuck together Verse 25. I've got one more page to turn here. The generous soul will be made rich. Now this section we're talking on is going to be scriptures that affirm and confirm that God will bless those who have a generous heart. It says, The generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will also be watered himself. In other words, what we just read before, that what you give to others, God is going to give it back to you. You cannot outgive your father. You can't. You know, it's funny. When I was driving for Lyft and Uber, every time I would get a um, tip, I would always end up giving it away. And there were certain days when I really wanted to use the tip on something for myself. I'll be honest, I'm not perfect. I have a selfish side to me, uh, you know, I have a selfish streak in me at times that makes me angry. I, I pray about it and I ask God to cleanse me of it because I confess it to him because it's there. Because we're human beings, we all have a selfish streak. We all have a place in us, you know, certain things that make us selfish. Some things may not bother you a bit to give away and then other things it just drives you crazy. You know, like I hate to give away, um, like food is a struggle for me to give away. Not, not in general, but like if I have a meal and, and I'm looking forward to enjoying that meal and then somebody comes over and I have to share it with them and I'm just being transparent with you guys, it'll bug me <laughs> to some extent. And I'm better about it now than I've ever been. Praise the name of Jesus. I used to get really irritated inside. I'd be like, man, I was going to enjoy this. And now I got to split it in half because I got to share it with my friend, you know, and that wasn't even somebody that, you know, was a stranger or whatever. And, and there's times I'll, I'll laugh because I'll go buy myself a snack when I'm out shopping or I'm out doing a doctor's appointments or something, and then I'll see somebody. And I will have bought too much for myself. And I'll know, oh, that what I bought extra was meant for this person. And so every time I would be driving with Lyft and Uber, I would get tips, cash tips, and I would end up giving them away by the end of the day. And I would just run into people because... <laughs> And the Lord would bless me. But you know what? I didn't receive those blessings for myself. I received them for those other people. And God just put them in my hands so I could get them to the other people. So the generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's let's go over to uh, Proverbs 19, 17. Okay? Let's see here. says he who has pity on the poor lends to the lord and he will pay back what he has given Ooh, there it is you guys right there right there there's your promise proverbs 19 17 you should write that down so that you don't forget he who has pity on the poor lends to the lord and he will pay back what he has given praise the name of the lord thank you father god Thank you for this reminder today, Lord, because it's so easy to forget. It's so easy to forget. Let's go to 22 verse 9. He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Mm -mm -mm. So the Lord is saying, if you're looking, you have a generous eye, you're looking for people to help. And you're sharing your bread with them. You're sharing your money with them. You know, whatever it is that God puts on your heart to give. Whatever that person's need is. Maybe it's just a bottle of water. Maybe it's a, a soda from the store, you know. Whatever it is. God says, keep, you know, keep looking. Have your eye ready to be generous. Be watching for opportunities to give. Because you're going to be blessed if you do. Okay, God loves a cheerful giver. I didn't even bring that verse in, but God loves a cheerful giver. 
He likes it when people get excited about giving. It blesses him. I'm telling you, it blesses our Father when we are givers. And you know why I believe it truly is? And, and we're going to talk about that scripture too. It's we're being like him. Think about how generous God is. He gave us his son. Let's think about that for a minute. He loves when we give. Because when we give, we are reflecting him. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I brought this one in because I wanted to even talk about loving your enemies, those people that hurt you. Let's go to chapter 6, verse, let's do 7, no wait, 27, I mean. Luke chapter 6, verse 27, we're going to start there. But I say to you who hear, so be listening, guys. Jesus says this, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, and bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. So even if you give to someone and they're spitefully using you, what does Jesus say? Bless them, pray for them, love them anyway. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. Oh, that that goes against the grain for us people, don't it? For, For human beings in this world. We are told to strike back. We're told not to let anybody walk on us. We're told to, you know, how dare you do that to me? Do you know who you're doing? Do you know who you're dealing with? Do you know who you're talking to? You know, we get so prideful. We think so higher of ourselves than we are. And God says, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves like I did. Jesus let them strike him and he never even said a word. He says, and from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. So give him your shirt too. Give to everyone who asks of you. Everyone. He doesn't hold back. God doesn't hold back. He says, give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods. In other words, him who steals from you. Don't ask for them back. If somebody borrows something and never gives it back, don't just let it go. Let it go. Because God's going to give you something better if you do. If you don't let harbor, uh, resentment harbor in your heart. He says, and, as just, and just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Peter tells us that later in the, the Bible. He talks about, in his books, he talks about the fact that loving somebody who loves us doesn't mean anything. Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good for those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive payment back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. I mean, it's fine to lend to somebody and receive the payment back, but don't do it with that intent. It says, but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Praise God. You know, I have taken money back from people I've loaned to sometimes. But honestly, and this is because of these passages right here, I love to be able to give if I am able to give to someone and not have to expect it back. I love that. And I love to tell people when they try to pay me back, keep it, keep it. I love how God, I wouldn't have to ever be blessed with financial gain back from God. I, I, the feeling that comes when you give and you give with no motive behind it, other than love is a, a feeling that is beyond imagination to me. I, every time I walk away and I'm like, Lord, thank you for letting me do that for someone. And it's, I've done it for strangers. And I, I bless the Lord from the bottom of my heart that he's given me opportunity and that he gave me the, fund, the funds or the food or the whatever to be able to do that. And, and am I perfect in it? No. But... I'm just saying the times that have, that has happened in my life have been some of the most, 
some of the biggest rejoicing times in my life have been when I've given to others. Let's go over to chapter 12. And let's go to 33 and 34. Now here, Jesus is talking about not worrying. And in 33, he says, sell what you have and give alms. In other words, give to the poor. Provide a treasure or provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So in other words, when we give, instead of holding our money bag, our money in bags that are made from earthly you know, provision, we're actually putting our finances into money bags that are heavenly. Okay? We're putting it in treasures. It, we're putting our treasure into money bags that go towards the heavens, that go towards the kingdom of God. And no one can take it from us. Whatever you build up in your treasure for heaven... No one's going to ever be able to take that from you. When we see Jesus, we will receive everything from our inheritance to all that we've sown in this life and more probably knowing our God because he gives without measure. God gives without measure. You know, I, I think I probably can say that there are people that may think or have thought in their lifetimes, then why doesn't God make me rich? You know, but I believe personally that The fruit of the Holy Spirit is more important than the gifts of the Holy Spirit because the gifts without the fruit are dangerous. And the reason I say that is because if God were to gift you with great finance, would you be a help to the kingdom and you've got to truly search your heart on this? Or would you be a hindrance because you would end up hurting yourself with that finance, that financial gain? Because many people do. And I think that God has set our boundaries and that as we grow and we mature in the Lord and in the fruits of the Holy Spirit, I believe he increases our boundaries. As we show that we can be accountable, as we show that we can be responsible with what God has given us. So if you're not able to give a dollar to a stranger, how are you able to manage a million dollars? Do you see what I'm saying? And that kind of hurts all of our flesh when we think of that. It kind of makes you go, ouch. But that's the kind of ouch that makes you go, Lord, I need your help. Because if I can't manage to hand a stranger $20 that I see is in need because I'm too busy questioning what they're going to do with it, then how am I to handle $2 million? Yeah. You know, we... we, We have to think on those things. There's a reason that God doesn't increase us to the measure that we would like to be increased. And the people we see increased that are in the house of God, if they are people who are responsible and God has has given them an increased measure, then we need to trust the Lord knows their heart and he knows their level of responsibility. He knows what they're able to handle and what they're able to manage. And, you know... Eventually, if they're not truly, if they say they reached that point where that you know their character was there and they were doing what was right, and then they fall, it usually comes out eventually. So we can't go to God and be like, "Why aren't you blessing me like you're blessing this person or that person?" Or you know, we need to trust that God knows what's going on and what's happening, and that He's covering us. Many times he's protecting us. I think most of the time God is protecting us from ourselves. (laughs) Seriously. Let's go over to Acts verse 20. I mean, chapter 20, verse 35. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Paul is telling, you know, he's telling them, I support the weak. And I'm doing it as an example for you. I'm laboring like this so that you'll know as well that you need to support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Okay? 
It's more blessed to give to others than it is to receive from others. Now, we're going to go to point three. Point three is initiating God's generosity. Or imitating. I'm sorry, I'm reading my own handwriting and that's not good. <laughs> Let me get a drink, kids. Me and my beet juice. <laughs> so if we go to Im imitating God's generosity. Remember we talked about the fact that the reason... I believe one of the reasons that it blesses the Lord so much when we're generous is because he's so generous and it shows that he is, we're reflecting his image when we behave that way. Okay. And we also talked about imitating God. You know, he tells us to imitate him. Paul says, imitate me as I, so in other words, copy me, do what I do, even if you're not feeling it. Do what's right. Just do the behavior. Eventually, your feelings will catch up. Okay? I know there's a saying in our day and age, fake it till you make it. And I don't want you to fake it. But the Bible clearly says, imitate me. So if God is saying, you may not be feeling it right now, but you come to me and ask me for help. And the feelings will follow because they'll be there for me. You know? So do what God tells you to do. Let's go over to Matthew. Even when it's hard and we don't feel it, okay? Just do it anyway. Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So in other words, when men, when people, human beings, see you doing what is good, what is right, what is true, it glorifies Father God because you are imitating Him. You are behaving as He behaves. And that is what will bring people to Christ as we reach out and reach out. And it might take a while to get through to people, but that's okay. Do it anyway. Let's go to Ephesians. Or no, let's go to Luke 6.30 first. I want to try and stay in order here if I can. We have so many. I want to at least try to be in order. <laughs> Luke 6. I'm trying to find my spot again. I lost my place. Oh, wait. I'm in the wrong place. I apologize. Go to John. <laughs> I looked in the wrong paragraph. Go to John 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And we know right above that is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. See, the world is already condemning itself. Now, go with me on this. God sent Jesus not to judge us, but to die for us. Because he knows those who do not accept the gift of life from Christ have already judged themselves. They have already chosen their path. And judgment will come at the end. Okay? So up until that point, God has given his son... He brings the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He brings the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. If people, even if they're wicked in their lives, and, or even if they're unsaved and unborn again, and they don't accept Christ, if they do what God has sown into the law of, of, of life, which is the law of giving and sowing and reaping, if, let's use that as the perfect example, you can find unbelievers atheists even who sow and are you know do the basically keep God's statutes not even meaning to just because they're doing it because it's what's right they will reap a harvest they will be blessed if they make right choices they'll be blessed and so God shines upon the just and the unjust and he says I didn't send my son into the world to judge or condemn them I sent him to save them now it's up to them if they choose condemnation or salvation. See? 
Let's go to Matthew, I mean John 15, 12. And we have a tendency to just, and I'm chief among sinners. I, I can be very judgmental towards sinners. And, and I, I have been reminded a lot lately, praise God, that he didn't call me to do that. He called me, we're actually called to judge within the body of Christ. We're not called to judge the world because they don't know what they're doing. They don't always realize. They, I mean, they know maybe it's right or it's wrong. But they don't understand why, because they don't have the, the blood of Christ on them. They don't have the Holy Spirit convicting them. They don't understand because they don't believe. And so God tells us through Paul not to even judge the world. He's like, don't judge them. Judge within the house of God. If you see a brother and a sister sinning, then you need to, you need to talk to them. But if you see the world sinning, that's, you should expect it. That's what they do. They sin. They don't know. When you hear a sinner out there cursing and cussing, they don't know. I mean, they may have, they should have maybe enough common sense to not act that way in public or whatever, you know, but that's a different thing from actually realizing I shouldn't do this, period. I shouldn't be grieving the Holy Spirit by cursing this way, you know, and so we find it offensive as Christians and it is offensive. However, God tells us don't judge them for it. They don't know better. They don't know any better. That's how the rest of the world talks. Why shouldn't they talk like that, right? So he didn't come in to condemn us. He came to save us. Again, we go back. I'm going back to that because that just came to st stuck in my craw. <laughs> it made me want to talk about it. Um, let's go to, let's read our, our verse, John 15, 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater than these he will do because I go to my father. Now, I read this one because this one shows us Jesus saying, you as my disciples are going to do the things I did. What did Jesus do? Jesus prayed for the sick. He healed, he healed the sick. He prayed for the poor. He gave to the poor. He was there. He had compassion and empathy for them. He loved them. He touched the leper. He held the blind person. He did what needed to be done. He gave water to the thirsty. He you know what I'm saying? He was a blessing to everybody he came in contact with. And he said, the works that I do, you're going to do also, but you're even going to do greater works than these. And I, I think when we read that, we go, well, then why aren't we seeing more miracles? Well, maybe that, you know, that is part of it. But I think it's also the works that we do. We, he was one man who could, who was in one region. He could only touch the people he was in that region with. We are the body of Christ. We cover the globe. So our reach is much, much greater than Jesus's reach was. Do you see what I'm saying? Because he was in the limited body of a human being. Even though he was God, he was in the form of man. So he could only be in one place at a time. He could only touch those who were right there with him. But instead, he says, I'm going to go. And it's going to be better because when I go, y'all are going to get to work. And you're going to move over the planet and you are going to help the needy. You're going to have love and compassion and empathy for all of them, just like I did. And you're going to do my work, but you're going to do even more works than I did. Okay. And that's exciting, right? Let's go to James or no, let's do second Corinthians first. Cause that is in order. I have it written out of order on my list, but that's okay. We're going to go to, um, second Corinthians chapter eight. Verse 9. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this, de this devotion. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Wow. He gave... If you think about it, guys, for a second, and stop for a minute and really contemplate this, Jesus laid down his deity... When he was with Father God, when we, he was with Holy Spirit in the heavenlies, he had everything. And when he chose to become the man Jesus, he gave it all up. He laid it all down and he became poor. He became a human being. That's like us taking on the form of something much lower than ourselves. 
And because we're made in his image, I'm not going to use the analogy I've heard. I've heard people say it's like an ant. You know, it's like a, a man becoming an ant and going down and speaking that ant's language. But you know what? Ants are not made in the image of God. We are. So he took a lower form of himself because we are made in God's image. I just want to point that out. And he says we are made just a little lower than the angels. And the angels are with him in person right now. And that's the reason I believe we're just a little lower than the angels because we're made from the dust. They're already in their spiritual bodies. You know what I mean? They're heavenly bodies. But we're made in his image. Praise God. And he says, I became poor for you so that you could become rich. Rich in what? Rich in mercy, rich in grace, rich in faith. I'm not talking about money and finances and houses and cars. That can come if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your body, your strength. He says, I'll add all those things to you in this life. But that isn't what we're rich in. We are rich in spiritual blessings. And we're not, we're not walking in those as much as we should be, right? Praise God. And when we realize we're already rich, it's easier to give. <laughs> Praise your name, Lord. Now let's look at James. We're going to go to James. Chapter 1. Love James. Mm -mm -mm. Love me some James. Brother of Jesus. Half brother of Jesus. Praise God. If you didn't know that, I love that fact when I found it out. Him and Jude were both half-brothers to Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. It says here in verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Praise God. So everything we receive in this life Yes, we may have to work for it. But you know, there are times in your life where you work like a dog and you barely earn a penny. You just scratch the surface of anything financial or any blessing. But God says every gift that comes into your hands, look around you right now as you're listening to this devotion and look at everything that you own, everything you've been blessed with. Think about all the relationships you have, all the good times you've had, all the laughter, even the tears, all of the wonderful things in life that you've been given from material items to spiritual things, to mental, emotional health, to physical health, to physical or relationship, relational uh, uh, blessings. Everything has been given to you from your father. He's a generous God. And he says, oh, be like me. Oh, child, be like me so I can give you even more. He wants to give us even more. He really does. Let's go to point number four. Write this down. Helpfulness is a sign of holiness. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's go back over to Matthew. When we help others, it's a sign that we're walking in holiness. You want to know if you have holiness in you. What's your heart attitude? What's your heart attitude about giving? Hallelujah. And it doesn't just mean money. It means anything. What's your heart attitude about giving your time at church? Are you volunteering at church? Are you helping out in some way? Are you giving others a break? Are you making an elderly person a meal? Are you going and visiting the elder and spending elderly and spending time with them? Are you giving of yourself to anyone in your life? Chapter 4 verse 42, I mean 5 verse 42 of Matthew. Give to him who asks, and from who, from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. The Lord says, don't, don't turn anyone away. Don't look at that person and go, oh, um, you know what? I don't think you're going to use this for what you're saying you're going to use it for. Or I don't think um, I really want to give today. Or, you know, don't turn anyone away. Go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's go to verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's unpack that. We need to walk in the good works that God prepared before we were ever here. Because as we do that, it's going to show that we are his workmanship created in the image of his son. 
Okay? So we should be walking in the good works he's prepared before we were ever here. Showing and reflecting Christ. Because we're his workmanship. He has created us to be givers. He's created us to be givers. He wants us to serve others as he served us. That's why Jesus got down and washed his disciples' feet. He was giving them an example of how he wanted them to live. Amen. And we are his disciples if we've accepted Christ as our Savior. Let's go over to Galatians 6.2. I'm trying to move a little faster because I'm running out of time. I got overzealous with these scriptures today. I was very excited about the fact that there was so much to talk about and giving. I, I love it. I love it. I love this subject. I love this aspect of life. Galatians 6 verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay. This is, you know, it's hard sometimes. And we actually are going to talk about this tomorrow of bearing other people's burdens and of being there to rejoice with them. Not just the negative things, but to, to have empathy. We're going to talk about tomorrow. And I'm excited about that one too, because God is so good and he has so much empathy toward us. He, you know, Jesus understands us. It tells us that he is our high priest. He understands us. Hebrews tells us that. And because he took on the form of man, he can empathize with us. He can sympathize. He experienced all that we experienced. And he wants us to bear one another's burdens. And when we do that, we actually fulfill the law of Christ. Mm. There is a lot of meaning right there. We are fulfilling what the Lord planned out for this earth to fulfill. When we bear one another's burdens, when we help one another, when we're there for one another and we're not selfish or stingy in our hearts, God uses that. He uses it and he moves on the behalf of people around us. It's And he moves on our behalf as we move on another person's behalf. It all goes hand in hand. That's what I was trying to get at earlier. There's so many things I see in this. There's reasons why God wants us to be givers. He wants us to be imitators of him. Then we'll reflect his glory to man. And he wants us to give so that he can give to us, so that we can give to others. And he wants us to fulfill the law of Christ by giving. It's, it, there's just so much to this. There's so many more reasons than just, oh, God wants you to give so you can, you know, so you can be blessed. There's so much to it. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. Let's see. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Okay. Let's just keep reading. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to fulfill, to full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but in, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So God sees your work. He hasn't forgotten that you're laboring. Okay. It's not like that. He hasn't forgotten what you've done for him. And he says, keep doing it though. Don't lose hope. Don't just say, okay, I've done this long enough and I'm going to stop now. Because God says he wants you to continue. He says to be diligent until the end with hope. Okay? Don't become sluggish, but imitate those. In other words, the, those in the Bible, those around you, those you see who are faithful, those who you see giving and giving and giving of themselves. He says, imitate those that who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Okay? Let's go over to, um, I want to look at something real quick. Did we actually read? I don't, I don't think I actually read that, did I? I'm going to go back to Galatians 6 really quick here. Did I read it? Yeah, I did. Never mind. And so let's go over to Hebrews 13, 16. 
But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Don't forget to do good and share with others. These sacrifices, because they are sacrifices. What did the lady, the woman, the old woman, Jesus watched her put two mites into the plate and he said she has given more than any of these other people here. She brought a sacrifice. She, and you know, if we could talk to that woman, that God blessed her for that. You know he did. Because that is our God. That is how he is. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's go over to Luke. And if you're still with me, thank you for staying with me all this time. Thank you, thank you. I know this is a longer lesson. Praise God. Let's go to chapter 6, verse 30. I just thought it was really important because this is such an important subject. It isn't just about the homeless or about the needy. It's, It's about you too. It's about your heart and where your heart is because God loves a cheerful giver and he loves for us to make that sacrifice for him, for his kingdom. And I know each one of us want to bless the Lord. And I just wanted to really point out all the aspects of giving today that, that feed into all the different avenues of giving that it's not just, you know, Oh, I didn't give. I feel guilty. You know, here's why, here's how we should pray. Here's what we should do. And here's why we should do it. You know, let's read six verse 30. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. So again, imitate God. Don't ask for things to come back to you. If God, if they've taken them, if somebody borrows something and doesn't return it, let it go. Because God says that's righteousness. That's righteousness. John 15, 15, 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Oh, no, I'm on the wrong one. I'm like, that's not right. 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. See, that's what Jesus did for us. He laid down his life. And then he turns around and he says, you're my friends if you do whatever I command you. Hallelujah. Hey. I could do my, my, my pastor Sokies <laughs> right now <laughs> because that's saying, hey, you're, you want to be my friend and this, I'm laying down my life for you. Now you need to do what I command you to do. Give in return. Hallelujah. Let's go over to Romans chapter 12, verse 20. It says, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So if someone that you don't like or you don't get along with or someone who's actually done you in has a need, you be the one to fulfill that need. Because those heaps of coals of fire, some some Christians go, yeah, God, get them, get them. Do you know what those stand for? Those stand for repentance. Doing, treating Treating evil with good, overcoming evil with good, brings that, per- brings that person closer to the Lord. And that is imitating Jesus. That is being like him. That is walking in holiness. And holiness is a sign. Or helpfulness is a sign of holiness. Okay, we got one more in this path, in this, and then we're going to go to our last one. Romans 15, verse 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So, in other words, he stood in their way. Everything that should have reproached us fell on Jesus and he asks us to do the same for others Mm. the last point selfishness is a sign of wickedness Mm. that's a hard word that's a hard word we are going to go over to Proverbs okay and this is our last point today and we'll be done 
I don't usually take you over an hour in our messages. I, I hope some of you are still with me. Praise God. <laughs> Let me know in the comments if you're here. Proverbs 3, verse 27. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power of hand, your hand to do so. So if you know you have something that somebody has a need of and you're like, oh, just wait. The next verse tells us, don't, don't tell them to come back tomorrow. I'll give it to you then. He says, do it now. If you've got it in the power of your hand to do it, don't say to your neighbor, go and come back and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. Do not devise evil against your neighbor, for he dwells by you for safety's sake. Do not strive with a man without cause, if he has done you no harm. So if a person, if you know you have in your hand what that person needs, it is wickedness to hold out, out on that person. It's holiness to give right then. When the need is met, or when the need is, is happening right then, the need needs to be met. That's what I want to say. Let's go to 21, verse 13. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. Mm -mm -mm. That kind of goes back to what we were talking about when we were saying, if you give, you will receive blessing. When the light, you know, when you're in darkness and you give to somebody else who's in darkness, light will shine on your darkness. Well, that's the same thing right there. If you shut your ears to the cry of a poor person or somebody, and, and don't just think of poverty as money. We're talking about poverty of anything, okay? Because poverty comes in many forms, not just financial. You might meet a rich person who's poor in spirit and needs help, okay? Okay. So remember that when you hear someone cry out in, in, need, in need, you need to not shut your ears to that cry because there may come a time when you're crying and no one will hear you. Let's go to Philippians 2. Praise God. Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit but in lowliness of mind, but in lowliness of mind, I lost my place. My husband texted me right then. I'm sorry. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Wow. I mean, come on guys. It's very bluntly put there. Don't think highly of yourself and don't put your own ambitions and the things that you want in your life. You know, it's all about me. It's all about me. What it, Joyce Meyer used to do, the robot. Eh, eh, it's all about me. <laughs> Remember? And it's like, we do that. Our world, we, we're taught that. We are literally, self-help books are everywhere. How to be a better you and be all the you you can be. And, you know, just be real. Just be free. Just be you. It's, it's great to be me, you know, and it's selfies and it's this and it's that. And I need to, I need to work on my career and I don't have time for, you know, give to anybody else. I don't have time to have children. I don't have time to have a family. I mean, my goodness, we see so much self-centeredness in our world. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. There's a reason I don't post pictures of myself on my Facebook as often as I used to. If you go back, you'll see where I went through my periods where I did, but you'll also see long periods where I don't because I realize I'm like, oh, I'm taking too many pictures of myself. This is ridiculous. I don't need to do this. If you want to know what I look like, you know, there's a few on there. You can find them. And it's like, it's just not worth it. It's not worth it <laughs> to put yourself higher than you ought. But what is worth it is to give your time, your help, and so into someone else's life. Pay attention to others. Don't be conceited. Don't be self-ambitious. Praise God. The Lord loves a humble heart and he will lift you up. If you're humble, if you're truly putting others first, God's going to raise you up above where you've been. He's going to increase your borders, your boundaries. He's going to give to you because you have done what is right. And if you're not feeling it, do it anyway and ask God for the feelings. Ask God for the love of doing it. Ask the Lord. Humble yourself and say, Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need your help. I need you to make me feel this. I need you to make me want this. 
because I want what is right. I want to walk in holiness. I want to be generous. I want to be a servant, you know. Let's go to Proverbs. uh, Or no, I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong one. James. This is our last scripture, you guys. James, I promise. (laughs) Okay, we're going to go to 2, verses uh, 14 through 17. Faith without works is dead. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. We always say, oh, I'll be praying for you. But you don't give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? In other words, what what are you doing for them? If you're just saying, bye, God bless you. I'll be praying for you. And you know that they're destitute. What did you do for them? And it, it could be the smallest of gifts. I mean, you, you may only have the two mites, but God says, if you give that in your humble heart, I will return it to you in abundance. It says, thus also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And I'll show you my faith by my works. Okay. So he's telling us, praise God. Your works are a reflection of your faith. And your faith, if you have faith, you'll have works. It's a two-sided coin. Faith and works go together. And works are created by God. Because remember what we read. That we're His workmanship, created to do good works that He prepared in advance for us to fulfill. Okay? So remember, the Lord wants us to be givers. And I did want to say one more thing, and I'm sorry, I do have another scripture, but I'm just going to talk about it. There are times in life when you're going to see someone who's just lazy, okay, who doesn't want to work and who's capable of working. And don't judge that unless you are in a position where you know that person's situation and you know they're just being spoiled or they're just being lazy and lascivious and they're just laying around playing games or they're just, you know, and you know that about people who are up close to you. If you know that somebody is more than capable of doing what they're they're acting like they can't do, I told you earlier, don't look at a person and question their situation. But when you know that you know that a person's in a situation where they're capable, then it tells us in the Word in 2 Thessalonians, you don't even have to go there. I'll just jump over there really fast. There's two places I want you to see that it does confirm in 2 Thessalonians uh, 3.10. It says, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, and it says will not work, neither shall they eat. So when you meet a homeless person and they look capable, remember that that person's in a place in life that they may not be capable emotionally, mentally, or maybe physically. You don't know. So don't judge that. But if you know, and I'll use in a minute, I'll use a scripture here. It's 1 Timothy 5.8 and I'll show you an example of what I'm saying. My husband, my late husband, when we were young and we were first married and first had our son, he was not working. And my grandmother called and she said, Tara, I want you to tell Alex this. First Timothy chapter five, verse eight. If anyone does not provide for his and especially for those of his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The, gen- the, the King James says he's worse than an infidel. Okay, I quoted that. I read that to my late husband at the time. And he heard it and he ran out and got two jobs. It convicted him because he did believe. And it, when he heard that his behavior was worse than an infidel, that meant something to him. So judge that situation by your heart knowing what you know about the person in the situation but God is faithful and he wants us to be generous and he wants us to be givers and he says more about that than he does about what I just read you but I did want to point out there yes are times when you possibly will have to tell someone that that you know that you're close to you now brother I know you're capable of getting a job I'll take you out and help you fill out applications or I'll take you out and help you find a job but I'm not going to keep feeding you there are those times but they're very rare and far between, okay? So remember that. Let's, let's pray. Father, we know that your heart is tender toward the needy. We pray, Father, you would put opportunities in our paths to meet the needs of the poor and to serve the helpless, to serve those who are less fortunate than us. Father, give us compassion. 
and also help us to understand that we're blessing you when we bless them. That we're lending to you when we lend, when we give to them. I pray this today, Father, in your mighty, wonderful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I love you guys. Thank you for sticking with me. If you're here with me the whole time, you are awesome. I love you so much. And God bless you. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye.